research. Well, what we already know is that the causes of maternal death worldwide include hemorrhage, infection, and hypertensive disorders. Uh, therefore, you know that we'll always talk a lot about those three factors. Um, and, and when we talk about postpartum um, hemorrhage, we, we already know of the importance of the postpartum assessment. Uh, sometime in med surge, you probably talked about hypovolemic shock. You've talked about the importance of uh, prevention and actually patient safety and all those things we already know and we are going to apply when we speak about postpartum hemorrhage. Basically, what we want to do is identify the primary causes of postpartum hemorrhage because if we know what we know what's causing it, we can also do something about it. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the nursing actions and priorities and preventive measures for a postpartum hemorrhage. A postpartum hemorrhage, we there there's certain things that put a woman at risk, but even healthy women are at risk. We never really know who's going to hemorrhage and when. Um, at, at approximately, you know, after the delivery. So because of that, we know that every woman is at risk. The immediately when they come in, the first labs that we draw are a CBC to see what their baseline H&H &H is, what their blood clotting factor platelets are. But we also want to um, get a type and screen because every woman is at risk. Therefore, we need to have blood readily available for every woman who delivers a baby. We know that a lot of women bleed. We know it's a leading cause of death among women worldwide, um, postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, so we know that it can be life-threatening. But interesting enough, in all my years of practice, I've seen a lot of patients bleed and I've given a lot of blood, but I've never seen anybody die from a postpartum hemorrhage. Postpartum hemorrhage is considered a blood loss greater than 500 milliliters for a vaginal delivery because the normal is three to 500 or greater than 1,000 milliliters for a cesarean section. It's important to identify the underlying cause of the postpartum hemorrhage, therefore that we can do something about it, whether they're um, bleeding um, uh, from um, maybe some retained placental parts uh, versus uh, the inability for the uterus to contract. So what are some of the causes? Well, if we look at the graph here, 70% are caused by uterine acne. And uterine acne is basically the, the, the failure of the uterus to contract. So we call it the boggy uterus or a lazy uterus. It doesn't want to do its job of contracting to constrict those blood vessels. 70 is attributed to uterine acne. Therefore, if we talk about it, probably mostly what we're going to talk about is uterine acne. 20% is related to traumas like laceration, uterine rupture. Um, so those are huge. So that's the importance of assessment is checking, um, you know, for lacerations and also the healing um, part of that as well. Tissue is related uh, to the retained placenta. Uh, when we talked about the third stage of uh, labor, we talked about retained placental parts and how the doctor inspects the placenta to make sure everything came out. 10% of hemorrhages are attributed to that. Um, I think doctors and midwives are extremely good about looking at that placenta and checking for retained products, but it doesn't mean that something still could have left behind. And then coagulopathy or thrombin or blood kind of uh, um, related illnesses are about 1%, which is a very small percent. So looking at the pie, you can see that if uterine acne is the uh, biggest contributor to postpartum hemorrhage, we'd probably spend more time on that and also lacerations and rupture. So what are the risk factors? Well, anything that's gonna make it harder for the uterus to contract and do its job is going to be a risk factor. Macrosomia, a large baby. If you deliver a large baby, your uterus has been extended, it's been stretched out to the max. So just think about how much harder that uterus has to work to get back into shape. So that would be any cause. Anything that's causing the uterus to be distended or large is going to be harder work for it to get back into shape, which is puts that patient at risk for uterine acne, the failure of the uterus to actually contract. Uh, multiple gestation, the more babies you have, the harder the uterus has to work to get back into shape. A previous C-section also puts a patient at a higher risk for bleeding. 
Um, and also when we talk about that distension of the uterus, it could be from a large baby, it could be from um, um, multiple gestation, meaning twins or triplets. It also could be to too much amniotic fluid can also cause that uh, uterus to be distended and make it harder to get back into shape. High parity. Uh, those women, um, parity, remember, gravida para. Para is anything that a woman has delivered greater than 20 weeks. The more babies uh, a mom has had, the harder that uterus has to work to get back into shape. A prior history of a postpartum hemorrhage, if they've done it once, they might do it again. And then we have to pay attention to if mom is receiving any medication that might make their, her at a higher risk for bleeding like blood thinners. We focus on our nursing actions and priorities, and one of the things is focus on prevention. We take a close look at a patient's history. If she's having twin, twins or triplets, we know she's at a higher risk for bleeding. If it's her 10th baby, we've got that red flag flying over them because we're gonna be watching them like a hawk. If they've had a postpartum hemorrhage before, we're gonna watch them again um, because the chances of them hemorrhaging are greater. So we focus on prevention and ident early identification. Part of that is a good health history um, and then early prompt intervention. And part of uh, getting early prompt intervention is being aware of the, the patients that are at higher risk, but since we know that anybody can bleed out, those postpartum bundle checks and assessment of bleeding uh, immediately after delivery every 15 minutes is utmost importance and even beyond that as well. Because we know that hemorrhage is, uh, can it, it happen quickly, and believe me, a uterus bleeds rather quickly, there's written protocols, we have mock drills, we actually have simulations in the hospital so that we react quickly and we can communicate well <clears throat> and we work as a team. In our units, and like I know where I work at Banner, <clears throat> we have uh, rapid response teams that are specific for OB. And one of them is a postpartum hemorrhage rapid response where we bring in a little kit, we have everything we need and we know exactly what to do. We have drills, we have simulation on it. And again, we work together as a team and communicate well. So to prevent it, we look at an assessment of the risk factors. Uh, the postpartum assessment is a way of preventing by doing our fundal checks, monitoring the lochia and vital signs. Uh, we know that patients may not show signs and symptoms until approximately one-third of the entire blood volume is lost. Therefore, those assessments are of utmost importance. Early identification, well, when we're checking, are they bleeding? Are they saturating more than a pad an hour? Is that uterus boggy? Are they expelling large clots? Sometimes a large uterus that is like of the umbilical right after delivery means that the uterus is filling up with blood. So we have to massage that and make sure that there's not clots in blood that is making the uterus large. Hypotension is a late sign of hypovolemic shock for the postpartum hemorrhage. Tachycardia. So we know that when you, in med surge of hypovolemic shock, you know that the um, patient is bleeding out, their blood pressure is going to drop, their heart rate is going to go up, the respiration rate is going to go up, and their oxygen saturations are going to go down. Therefore, vital signs are really important to look at and ask how a patient is feeling. So what happens um, when we actually um, um, find that maybe there's a boggy uterus and too much bleeding going on? First of all, just massage that uterus. See if it firms up and the bleeding slows down. If not, you need to call for help because bleeding can happen quickly. Nurses will come in for a postpartum hemorrhage. You'll have a doctor and an anesthesiologist come in or a nurse midwife. If she starts to bleed a lot, you start to weigh the pads in the most accurate way of uh, saying blood loss, which one gram would equal one milliliter. We administer IV fluids for hy hypovolemia. Uh, we may uh, do an additional IV line, and at that time we draw labs. We'll need that additional IV line because one will be for meds and fluids, and the other will be in case the patient needs blood. So it needs to be an 18-gauge with normal saline and blood tubing. We would automatically put a Foley catheter in because if they go into hypovolemic shock, we need to measure urinary output, which needs to at least be 30 milliliters an hour. We monitor the vital signs, and of course we're going to give oxygen 10 liters via mask. We can all do that, and as somebody is constantly massaging, we can assess if that's working. If not, we can increase 
release oxytocin, which makes the uterus contract. We can give methogen IM, which also works to make the uterus contract. And um, some other drugs that we use sometimes is hemabate, which is again given um, IM. Um, hemabate, you have to watch with uh, the asthmatics and methogen, you might want to hold back if they uh, have hypertensive disorders. Cytotec is a very safe drug. Uh, we also use it to induce labor. It's a prostaglandin. <clears throat> we give very small doses like 50 micrograms um, in, the, in the cervical area for an induction of labor, but for a uh, postpartum hemorrhage, we would give 800 to 1,000 micrograms per rectum. And believe me, that works really well. I will say this is sometimes if the patient's extremely high risk, whether it's multiples or high parity or um, other risk factors, sometimes the doctor prophylactically will put prostaglandin per rectum just prophylactically after deliver. And again, sometimes we have to use all sorts of blood products to save our patients. So when we come into class, uh, you won't have this PowerPoint yet, but what we will do is a case study. <clears throat> 